They know the routine, don't they? If you will, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. It's our pleasure and our blessing this morning to continue in the book of Ephesians in our verse-by-verse -verse, uh, exposition of the book. And this morning we want to look at uh, the mystery of God's will. Ephesians chapter 1, um, mainly verses 9 and 10, but also I'd like to just come back and do a little bit with the, eight, the, the end of it, uh, verse 8. Let's bow, shall we, for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you this day for the privilege of being here. We thank you for the freedom that we enjoy in this country. We thank you for the great country that we have. We pray, Father, that you would keep it strong, that we would keep it strong, that we would uh, enjoy freedom and uh, relish freedom. And in these uh, times of elections that are coming up soon, within a month, we pray, Father, that we might be citizens who are concerned with our country and that we might uh, vote in such a way that freedom for the citizenry of this country, this great country, would uh, that we would continue to enjoy that freedom. We pray, Father, for our missionaries this day. We know that uh, some of our funds here go to support missionaries in Africa. We think of uh, Bill and Sue Vinton, who are back there now with their family. We ask that you will bless them. We pray for the Sanchezes who are home on uh, home assignment now. We pray for the ministry in, in South America and Brazil that the lollies have uh, begun and that they're part of their family is maintaining. We pray for Bob and Beth Xavier in, in Bradenton and for their work with uh, what they call fourth world people. And so Father, we just are, we pray for the Viernes family also and in the, uh, the Philippines. So we have uh, missionaries that we pray for and support all over the world. And we just thank you, Father, for them. And we pray for those that, all of those that preach the Lord Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. We ask, Father, that you will bless their ministries and encourage them uh, in the mission field where they are. Now, Father, we know that we come to this uh, time of the service we come to this day uh, many of us with problems with our in our own lives and anxieties that we may be facing and we just pray father that you would uh, calm us and assure us that as your children that you uh, are watching over us and you are working all things together for good in each of our lives and we pray thank you father for the progress that we've seen in in um, several individuals who have been ill and are recovering and we just thank you for that we ask now that you would uh, help us through the holy spirit that we would be directed at searching and finding something digging for the blessings that are in your word and we pray father that we might leave here this morning being blessed by understanding more about the mystery of your will we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> One of the things that we've been saying about the book of Ephesians is that we have many, many gems in here that we have to mine and find, and uh, that takes a bit of effort on our part. I, an interesting thing happened to me uh, this week. We had a runoff election in our uh, where I live and for sheriff, and uh, the sheriff of Pasco County. And I had been led to, to vote for this uh, one candidate last time. And uh, that candidate and someone else was in a runoff election. And so during the month that preceded the first election and the runoff uh, just this past week, I received a, 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 a letter from uh, the candidate <clears throat> candidate's wife, the other candidate's wife, the one I didn't vote for. And uh, her name was Mrs. White. And so Mrs. White, in that letter, uh, proceeded to tell all the people that she had written to, including myself as a registered voter, uh, what her husband was really like. 
what a great guy he was. Just a, just a neat guy. You know, she's going on about her husband and father and all, what kind of great father he was. And I, so I read all of that, and uh, I thought that was really nice that she did that. But I was still led to vote for the other candidate. So uh, I'm on, I went to the polling place uh, by myself, I might add. <laughs> it's interesting that in this, re in this runoff election, there's only one vote. There's only one race that had to be decided, and that was this one, one race. So uh, Alice didn't feel too good, I don't think. And uh, Was that it, or was it just apathy? I think it was a little bit of apathy there, too. But uh, anyway, uh, as I'm going into the uh, voting precinct, it's a school gymnasium, uh, there's only one, they're allowed to, to have people there with signs and so on, but they got to stay 30 feet away from the door of the, of the polling place or something like that. So there's one person over there, and it's uh, vote for Bob White for sheriff. And I walked up to her and I said, you must be Mrs. White. And she says, yes, I am. And I said, well, I got your letter. And I said, I, I, I thought it was a nice letter. And she said, well, thank you very much. So I went in to vote, voted for the other guy, <laughs> came out, and I said to her, I said, may the best man win. And you know what she said to me? She said, thank you. I thought that was a wonderful response. She knew who the best man was. And uh, it wasn't any doubt in her mind who the best man was, but she assumed, I think, probably that I voted for her husband. But uh, anyway, uh, she knew who the best man was. She was convinced in her mind who the best man was. She, uh, she, she had lived with a guy, and she knew. I thought that was the neatest response. And uh, she was confident. She, she was assured that he was the best man. Well, it turns out, he won by 60% to 30-some percent, so her man is in the runoff election with, with, the, with the other party's candidate in, uh, in the November election. But I thought to myself as I walked away from there, I thought, well, there's somebody who has assurance and confidence about someone that they know. And as I was uh, uh, thinking about that this week, I thought, boy, if we as Christians had more assurance and knowledge of uh, the things that are ours in the Lord Jesus Christ, how much stronger we as individual Christians would be. I think there are many, many, many Christians within the body of Christ in various denominations and various churches who do not understand who they are in the Lord Jesus Christ and what they have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are mining these things out. We have mined the fact that uh, we have been chosen in Christ, verse 4, before the foundation of the world, us. Uh, a wonderful thing to notice here is all the personal pronouns. He chose us, in verse 4, in Christ before the foundation of the world. We've been chosen. And in verse uh, 5, having predestined us to adoptions as sons by Jesus Christ. We've been predestined to adoption as sons. And I think I might have misspoke myself a little bit last week when I was t talking about the, in, uh, in, in Roman law, the inheritance would go to one person, but I, I, I hope I, uh, several children in the family could be adopted and placed in a position of inheritance where they would inherit certain things uh, and, and, and not get equal amounts necessarily, but receive an inheritance. We have been chosen in Christ uh, predestined unto adoption, that the moment that we came and trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were full-grown children in, uh, in the family of God, in the body of Christ, with all the rights pertaining thereto, and the right of inheritance is ours because of who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have redemption, verse 7. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, the greatest benefit, one of the greatest benefits that we as, as Christians have is the knowledge of the forgiveness of sins. Our sins are forgiven. When we come to know Jesus Christ, our sins are taken care of. They are forgiven. Past, present, and future sins are taken care of. And we never have to worry about what's going to happen to our sins. They are taken care of. 
Now, when we do sin as Christians in our, in our Christian life, it, it, uh, it uh, disrupts our fellowship with God, but it does not disrupt our relationship with God. We still are his pride and joy. We are God's pride and joy. We are his sons and daughters, part of the family of God. So we've been redeemed by the paying of the price. We've been uh, op apolutrosis. We've been, a price has been paid with the idea of freeing us. And we've been freed. We've been freed from sin so that we can serve a God in the newness of our mind and in the newness of our heart. And then it talks about, uh, uh, in verse 8, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, verse 7, uh, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Tony talked about uh, uh, grace and what it is, what a wonderful thing it is to experience the grace of God. But it is given to us to experience and know the riches of his grace. Not just his grace, but the riches of his grace. So uh, we, we have a wonderful, wonderful blessings that are ours uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these are things that we are to know and have assurance and have conviction about. Now this morning, I want to look at the mystery of God's will. Because in verse 9 it says, God has made known to us the mystery of his will. And I think that probably 90% of Christians do not understand what the mystery of God's will is. And I want to spend uh, time on this. This is, this is a, a wonderful subject. I think that we at Grace Bible Fellowship uh, understand maybe and teach more on this doctrine of the mystery uh, of God's will than what other churches do because I think the Lord has blessed us and given us insight into that and that's our responsibility is to teach this. And uh, so we, we try to, uh, as Paul says in, in Ephesians chapter 3, to get all men to see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Well, <clears throat> this is another thing that is ours. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, Whatever this mystery of God's will is, it has been made known. God revealed it. God made it known. If you don't know it, or if I don't know it, that's our fault for not studying it and working through it and trying to find what it is because God has made known the mystery of his will. The word mystery here is used uh, 27 times in the New Testament. Twenty times it is used by the Apostle Paul in his writings. Six of those are in the book of Ephesians alone. Three times are in chapter 3. And chapter 3 is the real focus chapter on what Paul calls the mystery that was given to him, that was revealed to him. And so it's a, it, it is something that Paul is the primary speaker of the, on the subject of the mystery in the New Testament. Now, the mystery has two meanings. The word mystery or mysterion in the Greek has two meanings. One of them is, has the idea of uh, the telling of a secret. It simply means that a secret has been revealed. A secret has been made known. Something that had previously not been revealed is now revealed. And I would say that is the predominant primary use of the word in the New, Te in the New Testament and certainly uh, in the writings of the Apostle Paul. A secondary meaning of the word mystery is it is a mystery is something that is unfathomable. Easy for you to say. Unfathomable. Uh, something which is, uh, again, this is its secondary use. It, it, it involves the deep things of God. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 2, Paul talks about the mystery of iniquity or the mystery of lawlessness. I, I think that that's something that I can't fathom. I, uh, I think it's deep, the, the idea of the mystery of lawlessness, the mystery of iniquity. When I look at the, uh, at the scriptures, and I see God creating Adam and Eve in the garden, and I see them there without a sin nature, without a sin tendency, and yet 
with only one thing that they were not to do, and yet that is the very thing that they chose to do. And, and sin and iniquity was introduced into the human world, into humanity. And every descendant of Adam is condemned with that sin nature or that sin tendency, uh, except, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was without sin. I think that means he was without that inner uh, tendency to, toward sin. But uh, there are some things in the Bible that are deep. But I want uh, this right here. It does is not talking about the unfathomable, uh, how deep God's will is, <laughs> the unfathomable will of God. This is not talking about that because he says he's made known to us the mystery of his will. You see, this is something that has been made known. So it's not something that's, that is, is, is something for us to cogitate on and, and that we, we'll never be able to understand it or comprehend it or we'll have dis disagreement on. But this is something that has been made known. And so here we have it used in its primary sense, the idea of, um, of something which is a secret which has been revealed. Uh, David Martin Lloyd-Jones, the English... Uh, uh, preacher and commentator says that the mystery, this mystery is something which is undiscoverable, undiscoverable to the unaided human mind. This is something that cannot be discovered by the human mind. It is something that is revealed by God. God reveals it. The Holy Spirit teaches us so that we can understand. And I'm afraid that in the body of Christ today and in churches today, many, many people, the majority of people, do not understand what is the mystery of God's will. Um, in Paul's day, there were, there were secret clubs. There were mystery clubs, clubs that had secrets. And so you would join the club and get in, and as you got in, it was revealed to you what the club was all about. Uh, kind of, sort of, like uh, the Masons, I would think, nowadays. Um, I remember I had a church, uh, first church I ever had in Michigan, when I was just out of Bible college, uh, found out that one of the guys in the church, or he's a peripheral guy in the church, uh, was a part of the Masons. And I said, well, isn't that a secret organization? And he says, well, no, he says, that's an organ we're an org organization with secrets. And, uh, but in Paul's day, they had those too. They had mystery clubs, so to speak, where you would, we would join that particular thing and then you would find out something about them. Well, uh, that's still the primary, kind of the primary sense of the word. Now, uh, I don't know if you picked it up in the scriptures that reading this morning from Daniel 2. Did you read that? Did you see that where it talked about the secret there, that God is the revealer of secrets? I want you to look back in Daniel chapter 2, if you will. Uh, <clears throat> the the uh, chapter, Daniel chapter 2, is about Dan, or Nebuchadnezzar having a dream. And uh, he gets all his wise men and soothsayers in, and, and uh, he tells them he just was, was, was not reasonable at all Nebuchadnezzar said to them, tell me my dream and then give me the interpretation of my dream. Well, that's not kosher, you know. I mean, uh, and they said that to him. They said, Nebuchadnezzar, just, come on, just tell us what uh, the dream was and, and uh, we'll make something up. No, I mean, we'll tell you what it means, see. But Nebuchadnezzar said, you tell me what I dreamed and then tell me what the interpretation of the dream was. And I think there's a very, very good lesson in Daniel chapter 2 as to what a secret is. In a few verses here, go down to verse 16. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 16. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. The king has just said that if these guys don't come up with the dream and the interpretation, he's going to barbecue them. He's going to burn them up. He's going to burn their houses into ash, piles of, of ash. 
And so Daniel goes in and says, uh, King, would you, would you give us a little bit of time? Drop down to verse 19. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel worshipped God because God revealed to him the secret, what it was. And you see, this, this is what a secret is. It is, and, and I'm so glad that Nebuchadnezzar was this stubborn because that's the idea of what happened to the Apostle Paul in the New Testament too. God revealed to Daniel the secret, the, the dream, and as we'll read here in a few more verses, and the interpretation of it, you see. God gave to the Apostle Paul the secret, a secret. And it is given to us to understand it. it, it the, the, the revelation of the, of the mystery or the secret is here, but it is important for us that, to understand that it is there for our understanding. In verse 22, we read, God reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. Verse 27, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. I think that is, that is so wonderful. There is a God, especially if you understand anything about the secret that the Apostle Paul is talking about, the secret of God's will. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days, your dream and the visions of your, uh, uh, of your head upon your bed were these. And so uh, Daniel commences to work through that. Look at verse 30. But as for me, Daniel says, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king that you, O king, may know the thoughts of your heart. You see, there was a purpose in this whole thing coming about, and that was that Nebuchadnezzar could understand what the dream meant, and of course all of us through the word of God here as we have the word of God. Now, I won't go into what the dream was, but do you remember the image, the head of gold and, and the, the shoulders of silver and brass and, and uh, iron and feet of uh, iron mixed with clay and so on? It was a picture of the history of the times of the Gentiles from Nebuchadnezzar clear down to the time when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to earth at the end of the tribulation period and establishes his kingdom. Well, here you have uh, the idea that God reveals a secret and gives the interpretation or the understanding of it. In the New Testament, in the book of Colossians, you, if you go, want to go there, if you, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 25 and 26. Colossians 1, 25. Paul says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, or you could write that stewardship there as dispensation from God, which was given to me to, for you to fulfill the word of God, to complete the word of God. Um, just some special stuff there, people, regarding the revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul and that it was to complete the word of God. You say, well... Uh, how can that be when, when uh, John wrote something after Paul wrote this? How can Paul say this completes the word of God when John hadn't written the book of the Revelation yet? Well, I think the answer to that is, is that the book of Revelation is an extension of uh, Old Testament prophecy. It's, a, it's a, uh, uh, an embellishment of Old Testament prophecy, and it's an explanation of it. What's going to happen mainly in the tribulation time, you see, 
But what Paul is writing here about the dispensation that was from God that was given to him is something that wasn't anywhere found anywhere in the Bible, and so it 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 completed it out. It it it, it fleshed it out, and so you have this prophetic part of the Bible, and then you have this secret part which comes in that was given to the Apostle Paul. Uh, read on here in verse uh, 26. Uh, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. When is the now? I think from Ephesians 3, it's very clearly that the now is uh, through what was given to the Apostle Paul and to what was uh, going on then within the body of Christ. And so God is the revealer of secrets. He revealed to Daniel the secret of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He revealed the dream and the interpretation of it. And God revealed a secret to the Apostle Paul concerning the church, which is the body of Christ. Now, go back to Ephesians, if you will. The question is, what is the secret of God's will? If it is a secret that was given to Paul, what is it? What is it really? Well, <clears throat> I think that we're talking here about the secret of God's will as compar compared with and contrasted to the revealed will of God. You see, in the Old Testament, from the beginning of time, there are tremendous prophecies and tremendous things regarding the will of God that are revealed and made known. I mean, look at Genesis chapter 3.15. You have the promise of a redeemer, don't you? The idea that Satan has bruised the heel of, of uh, the redeemer, but the redeemer is going to come and bruise Satan's head. That's Genesis 3.15. You see, so back there you have the revealed will of God. There's coming a redeemer. And so throughout the Old Testament, you have the revealed will of God concerning the, the day of the Lord, the tribulation period, which is yet future. In contrast to that revealed will of God in the Old Testament, here we have the secret will of God, something that was not revealed in the Old Testament, but God is now making it known. And the vessel that he has chosen to give it to is this Saul of Tarsus who becomes the Apostle Paul. And just as Moses was the receiver of the law, as Moses was the great writer that Israel depended so much on, the books of Moses, the first five books of the, of the Old, Old Testament, in the New Testament, the comparable figure is the Apostle Paul to whom much of uh, to whom this revelation was was given? In the Old Testament, God revealed His will to man. He said He was going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Jeremiah chapter 31. And when Christ was on earth and He shed His blood, and and, and just before the shedding of His blood, He had the the uh, uh, ceremony with the cup and the, and the bread, and He says. Uh, this is a symbol of the blood of the new covenant. And so God is going to make and, and, and carry out that covenant that he's going to make, has made or will make with the house of Judah and with the house of Israel. He tells the nation of Israel that they're going to be a kingdom of priests. That hasn't happened yet, but someday he is going to do that in the, in the uh, tribulation period and in the in the millennial period, they are going to be a, a kingdom of priests. The revealed will of God is that God, through the nation of Israel, is going to use the nation of Israel to bless the Gentiles. That's the revealed will of God. That the nation of Israel, through their leadership and their spirituality, they are going to bless the Gentiles. The secret will of God... The mystery of the will of God is that it doesn't, hasn't happened that way for us. 
Paul says that in Romans chapter 11, through the fall of the nation of Israel, not through their spiritual leadership, but through their blindness that God has sovereignly placed upon them, Romans chapter 11, verse 11, salvation has come to the Gentiles. You see? That's secret. That's not revealed. That was unknown in the Old Testament, you see? And so the greatest way that we can study the Bible, I think, is to understand it through uh, something which is being prophesied and revealed and something which has not been prophesied but which is a secret. In the Old Testament, God revealed no contingency plan if Israel failed to be that spiritual leader. God didn't say in the Old Testament that, that uh, it does say in the Old Testament that the Gentiles are going to follow the nation of Israel and they're going to grab their robe and they're going to follow them up to Jerusalem because they know God is there. And it doesn't go on to say, however, if they slip along the way, I've got a contingency, I've got a backup plan. No. God did not reveal that. And so God has, because of the failure of the nation of Israel, has revealed the secret of his will, something that was not revealed beforehand. And when this church age is done, when we are finished with this body of Christ that we are in and the body of Christ is raptured away, guess what? All of those things back over there in the Old Testament that are the revealed prophesied will of God, those things are going to be kicked in and they're going to be fulfilled. God always does what he says he's going to do. Well, I hope you understand some of these things, some of these differences. This secret is something which is hidden in God. This mystery of the will of God was something that part of it was the part that was revealed to the Apostle Paul of this mystery regards the rapture of the church. You cannot find the rapture of the church in, in the revealed will of God. It's a secret. The idea of the Jews and the Gentiles being in one body without distinction, no difference. What you and I enjoy so much today is being able to go to anybody and say that salvation is open to them without exclusion, without distinction. And when they come to the place where an individual, be they black, white, Jew, Gentile, Muslim, whatever they may be, when they come to Jesus Christ and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior, they're placed within the body of Christ. And, and in the body of Christ, Paul says, there's neither male nor female, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, there's ne neither rich nor poor. That all those distinctions are blurred away in the body of Christ. That kind of lingo that we take so much for granted today is something that was not part of the revealed will of God. It is part of the secret will of God. That, by the way, that secret will which has now been revealed, and now we know. Well, that is, in my understanding and belief, is the secret of God's will. Now, verse 9 says that God made known to us the secret of his will according to his good pleasure. In other words, God is enjoying this. That thrills me. God is enjoying this. What God is doing right now through the body of Christ is something which is pleasurable to him. God has not been caught by surprise. The fact that Jesus Christ was rejected and crucified has not caught God by surprise. The fact that the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost to the nation of Israel and they rejected the leadership of the Holy Spirit in the early part of the book of Acts, did not catch God by surprise. This is the will of God. This is the plan of God. That God sandwiched this secret in here into, the, into human history, you see? And it pleases him. He's enjoying every minute of it. 
Amen. Amen. He's enjoyed. People are mixed up today. They, and I have, I have a great respect for all evangelical communities. I really do. I love evangelical communities, charismatics, uh, Presbyterians, Methodists, if they're evangelical and they preach the Lord Jesus Christ and, and salvation by grace apart from anything, I, I love them because they are serving a place within the body of Christ. But so many of my brothers and sisters are mixed up, you see, because they are living in a secret age, a secret dispensation under secret premises that have all now been revealed, you understand. They've been revealed. But they're living by prophesied Old Testament methods during an age which is unprophesied. And they're mixed up. And there are many, many things that I could go into. Law obedience, you see, law observance, given over to doing things because they have to. You see, it's messed up. Millions of Christians not understanding what grace is. Many other things are in that also. And so we have many of our brothers and sisters in denominations and so on who are living this new system, this new body of Christ, but many of them are living by the old means, and it is causing them problems. Well, this pleases God. Verse 10 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him, in Christ. Someday, all things are going to be gathered in Christ. You see, th th this is God's plan. God had a plan and he revealed part of it. And after it was uh, so far gone, so, so much time had elapsed, he inserted a secret part of his plan into it. That's going to be ended with the rapture of the church when the church takes away is taken away, and then he's going to follow his prophetic plan. But all in all, someday, in the dispensation of the fullness of time, which I believe is, 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 is going to begin probably with the millennial kingdom. That's going to be kind of the start of that type of thing. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he's going to gather together in one all things in Christ. Because Adam was in Christ. Noah was in Christ. David was in Christ. Whether it was before the law, after the law, Paul was in Christ. I'm in Christ. You're in Christ. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you, say, you see as your Savior. Tribulation saints are going to be in Christ. Millennial saints are going to be in Christ. He's going to gather together everything in Christ. The Bible says we're going to have a new heavens, we're going to have a new Jerusalem, and we're going to have a new earth. Book of Revelation. And somehow this is going to be inhabited. I personally believe that we are citizens of heaven. Well, uh, the message to us is that we are citizens of heaven. Many of my uh, grace friends believe that we're going to come back down to the earth in the millennial kingdom. We're going to reign with Christ upon the earth. I don't happen to have that conviction. If that's what happens, I'll be tickled. But I don't think that's the way it's going to happen. But wherever God wants us, that's where we're going to be. Because he's pleased. He's getting pleasure out of this. And so someday, God is going to gather together everything in Christ. Things that are in heaven and things that are on earth, they're all going to be together in him. This is a Christocentric universe. Christ is the center of everything. Christ is the center for the Old Testament saint. Christ is the center for we of the body of Christ. Christ is the center for the future saints of the tribulation and millennial kingdom. This universe is going to be Christocentric. Christ is going to be the center of all things. That's the way it should be, shouldn't it? And we are going to spend eternity worshiping him 
and Christ is going to be at the center of it. May I make an application from that? Since Christ is eventually going to be the center of everything in the universe, shouldn't he be the center of our lives right now? Isn't that very practical? It's not just that Christ is in the sweet by and by going to be the center of things. As Ian Thomas says, it's in the nasty now and now. Christ is the center. Christ needs to be the center of your life, and he needs to be the center of my life. Well, <clears throat> at the end of verse 8, he says, in, in, in all wisdom and prudence. I believe that this is not talking about God's wisdom and prudence, but I think it's a phrase that goes with having made known to us. In other words, as I see it now, I believe that in all wisdom and prudence, he's made known unto us the mystery of his will. This means that there is an, a wisdom component in understanding this. That's the intellect. That means that there needs to be Bible teaching. That means that there has to be Bible study. Wisdom. We need to pursue these things in all wisdom. There's a, uh, I, and I don't know how to say this without appearing to brag, but the Old Testament saints didn't have this. Not too long ago, we had what was called Desert Storm. You remember Desert Storm in, in the Arabian Peninsula, Kuwait, and so on? I would liken the Old Testament saint to being a trooper out here who was in, in a tank brigade or something like that, and that trooper was, had one objective, and that was to go over there and subdue those people over there. That was what the Old Testament saint saw. It was limited. There was limited vision on the part of the Old Testament saint. Didn't even have the knowledge of their sins forgiven, did they? Didn't even have that book of Hebrews says. But we as members of the body of Christ, I would liken to General Schwarzkopf. General Schwarzkopf was in the command booth, the command center, and he knew what the plans were and what everything that was going on. And as, as the plan was being executed, people were telling him what was going on. And so he knew what was going on all over the place. I would liken us in our vantage point as being like General Schwarzkopf. We are privileged because we have lived after the completed work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have lived after the revelation of the secret of his will. We are living in, in, in the time of the body of Christ. And these are tremendous things that we need to pursue in our intellect and with our understanding. And then he says, in all wisdom and prudence. Prudence here, I think, has the idea of doing things that end up pleasing God, that it, things that are pleasing to God, actions that are pleasing to God. And uh, so our responsibility, as I see it as saints, is in wisdom we are to consider this and try to understand this and study this. And in prudence we are to use it so that our lives are pleasing to God. So many, uh, some, who understand uh, the mystery of the will of God, the mystery of God's will, are big-headed about it. They take pride in what they know. And sometimes I think that that's, it's a sovereign act of God by the Holy Spirit, or he allows us to understand these things. But we need to not only with wisdom understand what this is talking about, but with prudence we need to use it in a way that is pleasing to God. How have you used this understanding of who you are in the Lord Jesus Christ as opposed to living a life according to the Old Testament program and the, and the gospel program and so on of the, of the first part of the New Testament. 
How have you used who you are in Jesus Christ to be pleasing unto him? I hope that you have. I, I, I think many of you have. I think most of you have. We want to use this in humility and uh, in thanksgiving to God for what he has done. I want to tell you that I think that we are living in the most exciting time in human history. I think it's the most exciting time of any time to live. I look at what's going on in the Middle East right now and all the rock throwing and the killings and so on, and I say, wow, it's getting close. You see? Something may be happening. It might not be. It might take another hundred years. I don't know. But I think that we, uh, merely by understanding who we are and where we are in the plan of God, his revealed plan in the Old Testament and his secret plan that's been in existence now for 2,000 years regarding the church, I think that we are living in a wonderful time. And I hope you use this knowledge of this